Dave Vaught has been the auditor since 2002. The auditor's office is the taxpayer's watchdog. They conduct audits of local governments, and they keep uh, make sure the books of the state continue to balance. And David and his wife, have been Plymouth members for many years, and we're very pleased to have auditor Dave Vaught with us for our lunch Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Whenever I get introduced, I can always tell the excitement in the room. Uh, CPAs are so well known for our personality, and everybody thinks, oh, good, they're going to talk about numbers. It's really exciting. Uh, well, I promise I will give you a flavor of what Iowa's finances look like, and I'll try to do that in a clear and understandable way. Uh, please keep this very, very informal. If you have questions as I go along, just raise your hand, and we'll try to address those. I can tell you that when I took over a your state auditor, Part of my concern about Iowa government is that we think very short term. And part of that is, is, is because of the political process. People are elected on a two year cycle, so one or two years out as far as they want to go. But we all know with our personal finances, if we don't also consider the long term of when we're making decisions, we don't make the best decisions. So today, what I'm going to do, I'll make sure this on, is to give you a flavor historical perspective of what we've been doing with Iowa finances so you can see how we've been handling those. I'm going to talk about expenditure shifts. It's something I've talked about for eight, nine years now, but the media is also starting to talk about those. And there are really bad shifts versus other types of shifts. I want to give you a flavor of those. I'll give you a comparison of some of the numbers. I'm going to point out a few concerns with the fiscal year 13 budget that we're in right now. I'll also point out some challenges to lie ahead of Iowa and not only Iowa, but all states as we go forward, and of course take questions that you might have. This first chart gives you a nice flavor of Iowa's finances, and I laid out a copy of the handout at each table, so if you can't see the chart for a while, you can take a look at your copy. And the first thing I want you to notice is at the top of the chart, you see that blue triangle line going across. You'll notice over on the right hand, right hand side, that's Iowa's population. So about three million people. So our population, total hasn't really changed from 1980 all the way through today. So the last 30 years, our population has been relatively flat. We do know the demographics of our population has changed, obviously getting much more aged population than we had previously. Next line you notice is that blue triangle line. Starts here, right here at the bottom. Diamond line there goes to just a nice steady increase. That is 1980 general fund expenditures adjusted for inflation. If our spending was only going up to the tune of inflation, you can see over here on the left-hand side, we'd be at about a $4.5 billion budget today. Next line you notice is the red line, the red box line. Starts at the bottom and works its way towards the top of the graph. That's Iowa's true total cost of providing general fund services. So that's what we're actually spending. If you look over on the left-hand side, you can see we're really actually spending about 6 to $6.5 billion. And I want you to know that gap between inflation adjusted and true total cost isn't all increased spending because in some cases the state of Iowa has taken on additional responsibility that used to be at the local level for like education and so forth. So that's part of the driving factor there. And the last line you notice there is the green circle line and that's Iowa's revenue stream. What you quickly see on that chart is where every revenue goes, spending goes, because that's the government habit. Whatever we have is spend. However, you'll also notice that as revenue flattens out, or worse yet, makes a correction downward, it's very difficult to bring that red box line, the true spending, down, because we've built a program that somebody's depending upon. It's very, very difficult to try and correct for those types of things. Now, you all see and hear about Iowa's general fund budget through the media, but what I want you to know is you're not getting the entire story, and this chart will help to demonstrate that. The very first column of numbers there called reported expenditures is Iowa's general fund budget. So whenever you hear or see something through the media, that is the set of numbers that they're talking about. So think of that as being your checking account, and you don't have enough money in your checking account to pay for everything that you need and want. So if you take a look at that second column of numbers, those are all the general fund services costs that we have shifted to and paid for with other funds and special accounts. Now we all know that it doesn't matter if you pay for it with a check, or in this case when we shift costs, it's like a charge card if you pay for it with plastic. 
It's still an operating cost, and that's what is reflected over on the right-hand side, which gives you a true flavor of what our cost of providing general fund services are, no matter what source of funds you use. Main thing I want you to see on this chart is there's up to 18% of the cost of providing general fund services that no one's communicating to the public because we're only talking about our checking account cost. And that really distorts what Iowa spending habits actually look like. Now, how have we been able to do that? Where have we been able to shift some of these costs? Obviously, you can see the very first one up there is the federal stimulus package. In fiscal years, for three years, we actually received from the federal government during the recession over $1 billion from the federal government to help carry out our general fund services. Now, we received a lot more than that for other things, such as roads and bridges, but just for general fund services, like Medicaid, like education, we received over a billion dollars. However, that still wasn't enough because of the spending habits that we had, that we had to take another one billion dollars from these other funds and special accounts in order to provide services here in the state of Iowa. Now, let's talk about those shifts. There are shifts that are gonna go on, that are gonna be okay, and others that are really, really bad. First question you ask yourself if you're going to shift the cost out of the general fund is, is it an ongoing general fund cost? In other words, is it like Medicaid or education? If it's not, it's okay. It's a valid shift. You can shift it. Let me give you an example. If we're going to remodel a building, we're only going to do that every 20 or 25 years. So it's okay to use a one-time source of funds to pay for a periodic expenditure. However, if it is an ongoing general fund cost like education, or Medicaid, the second question you ask, is there an ongoing revenue stream to pay for that cost? If the answer is no, you get to the bad, bad shifts that are called sustainability shifts. In other words, how are you going to sustain that cost once those one-time money come in? Now, we do have some others where we actually have an ongoing revenue stream to support it. And those are what I call policy or comparability shifts, because what we're doing is making it very difficult to come from one year to the next. And let me give you an example. In the fiscal year 12 budget, we actually took $100 million of tobacco revenues, took it out of the general fund, and put it over here in what we call the health care trust fund. Then we took $100 million worth of Medicaid costs, took it out of the general fund, and put it over here in the health care trust fund. Now, why did we do that? Well, I think it was because the promise was made, our budget in fiscal year 12, would not exceed $5.9 billion. Well, if you're at a $6 billion budget, if you take $100 million out of the general fund and put it in the health care trust fund, now you can honestly stand in front of the public and say, our budget is only $5.9 billion. We all know that's not the case because no matter where you put it, it's still a cost. But that was what really drove those comparability shots. So we need to get away from those also. Now this chart shows you the progress that Iowa has made for the last couple of years in bringing our finances under order. I will tell you, for the last eight years before that, I've been going to these things and I would present after someone ate, and people would say, Dave, hey, I really don't think your speaking topic is good for us when we just ate, because the facts were not good. But the good news here is we've made huge progress. You'll see there in fiscal year 11, those bad sustainability shifts totaled almost $700 million. Now the top part of the bar was the federal stimulus package, which you can see we have about $300 million still coming through in fiscal year 11. But that wasn't enough, so we took another almost $400 million from those other funds and special accounts. Really good news is you can see in fiscal year 12, we dropped that bad practice from $700 million all the way down to $100 million. And in the fiscal year 13 budget that we're in right now, we brought it down to about $70 million. Now, not where we want to be. We want to be at zero sustainability shifts, but we're definitely headed in the right direction in bringing Iowa's finances under control. Now, on those policy or comparability shifts, like that health care trust fund and so forth, we really haven't made much progress there. You can see, actually, in fiscal year 12, we took a step backwards because we moved that money out of the general fund and put it in the health care trust fund. So we need to get these under control, but like, as I said earlier, these affect comparability, so it makes it really difficult when somebody picks up the budget one year and tries to contrast it with the next year, you're comparing apples and oranges because you don't know what costs are actually being included. 
Let's take a quick look just at the numbers themselves. This shows you what the revenue stream was that was projected in each budget and what the expected spending was going to be on a true total expense basis. You can see in fiscal year 11, we had a $764 million spending gap. In other words, based on ongoing revenue, we were spending $764 million more than what our ongoing revenue stream would support. Really good news, fiscal year 12, we dropped that down to $220 million, and in fiscal year 13, down to $131 million. Once again, not where we want to be. We want to be down to a zero or a positive number there. But the good news is we're heading in the right direction at a very, very fast pace. Now, how have we been able to do that? This chart shows you the revenues that were projected for each budget. You can see there in fiscal year 11, we, we had projected about $5.5 billion worth of revenue. Look at in fiscal year 12, the revenue projection rose to $6.2 million, and in fiscal year 13, it rose to $6.5 billion. Iowa has had very, very good revenue growth. We're very fortunate from that. We've been even more fortunate than most states, and I'll tell you why. One is because our agricultural economy has been very positive, which has rippled through the entire economy. <coughs> Number two, our unemployment has been much slower than it has been nationally. We've been at least two points below the national average. And third, our housing market took a much smaller correction than it, what it did in many states. I have friends in the state of Nevada where people bought homes five years ago for $250,000. And today, they can sell those homes for $100,000. Now, there are just streets and streets lined with foreclosure signs. Imagine what kind of impact that has on the economy when those things happen. But if you take a look at it, our average annual revenue growth in the budget has been 8.8%. That is fantastic revenue growth extremely, extremely positive. Now, on the expenditure side, we've done a very, very good job, too. Remember, we started with that huge spending gap. If you remember back in fiscal year 11, that was the year that we provided 2% allowable growth for our local schools. However, we didn't have enough money in our checking account or on our charge card to pay for that, so that actually got shifted to property taxpayers. So if you put that on an apples to apples basis, because in fiscal year 12 and 13, we fully funded education plus some additional allowable growth, you can see our spending from fiscal year 11 to 12 was essentially flat, which is what we needed to do because as revenues grew, we were already spending more than we could afford, so we have to get it back in balance. You'll see that the average spending growth in the last two years has been 1.7%. Now contrast that with the 8.8% revenue growth, that's what's really brought us back together. Increased revenue growth and really controlled spending growth. This chart just helps to demonstrate that. It shows you going from a $764 million spending gap all the way down to $161 million because of the progress that we've actually made in those particular areas. You see the large revenue growth with the very, very small increases in spending to try and get us back into balance. I also like to take a look at our spending in terms of a dollar, because people can relate to that. Back in fiscal year 11, with the way we were spending, we were actually spending a dollar and 14 cents for every dollar of ongoing revenue. Really good news is we've really made big corrections, but let me put that in perspective. Back in fiscal year 11, if you had a family who was living on a $50,000 annual income, that family, under that scenario, would have to put $7,000 a year on their charge card and not pay it off in order to balance their budget. We all know that a disaster in the making. Really good news is we dropped it down to $1.04 in fiscal year 12 and down to $1.03 in fiscal year 13. Not where we want to be. We want to be down to a dollar or less. So we're not spending more than we take in. But huge progress in the right direction in a relatively short period of time. Now, there are a few things in the fiscal year 13 budget that we still haven't gotten right. One is we actually underfunded Medicaid. We all know if we were trying to set our own personal financial budget up, and we were putting together the numbers, and they didn't work. And we just said, well, even though my mortgage payment is $1,000 a month, I'm going to put $800 on this worksheet, and it's going to all work out mathematically. Well, it doesn't work out when it comes to reality, but that's exactly what we did. They couldn't reach an agreement on some of the Medicaid provisions. So they actually underfunded it by at least $41 million. We also did some transfers and stuff. But these are minor compared to what we've done before. 
There is one concern I have, and that's that last bullet. We have continued to provide salary and benefit increases, but we're not funding them at the departmental level. In other words, salaries and benefits are going up, but each department's getting the same dollars to work with, so we're not funding that increased salary and benefit cost. How are we accomplishing that? A lot of agencies are either doing furloughs or layoffs or not replacing people that actually leave. This is the fourth consecutive year that we've done that, and eventually it's going to have a huge impact on the level of services that we're going to provide. So we've got to get that back into balance as we go forward. Now, we've been in really, really good shape. We've made good progress. But we in Iowa and a lot of other states have some very significant challenges as we look forward to fiscal year 14 and beyond. And here's the first one I want to show you about. And this is about our ITRIS plan, our Iowa Public Employee Retirement <coughs> System. It is a defined benefit plan where we promise to pay benefits in the future. Back at the end of fiscal year 2000, that plan was 98% funded. In other words, we had assets set aside to pay 98% of the projected liability. However, at the end of fiscal year 11, you can see there, it has dropped down to 80% funded. So we've really, really lost grant. Now, even on a percentage basis, that sounds dramatic, but let's take a look at the numbers that it computes out to. Our liability back at the fiscal year 2000, when we were 98% funded, was only $227 million pretty manageable piece to make up. That liability now, at the end of fiscal year 11, has grown to $5.7 billion. That's almost equal to one year of general fund revenue. Now, the other scary part of that is, there are a lot of assumptions that go into calculating that liability, such as the investment return rate, life longevity, and those types of things. The experts will tell you that that number is probably at least two to three times that actual liability, depending on how you tweak the investment returns going forward. So it is something that we've really got to take a handle on. Some states are already starting to make changes because a lot of companies have gone from defined benefit to defined contribution lines because in the long term, it's very, very difficult. In fact, if you stop and think about defined benefit plans, when they were originally established, people would retire at like age 65, but they only live to be 70 or 75. Today, we have individuals that will retire as early as 50 to 55 that now live to be 85. That's a huge difference on the type of benefits that are being paid out. So a lot of states are starting to take a switch and saying, all employees today that are on that plan will stay on that plan, but new employees are going to go to a defined contribution plan. Iowa hasn't gotten there yet, but I'm sure it will be a conversation sometime in the future. Another area that people don't realize is that we have a huge reliance <coughs> on federal monies. We have about a six to six and a half billion dollars worth of Iowa taxpayer money that we bring in and that we call our general fund budget. But to actually carry out Medicaid, education, and all our general fund services, we get another almost six million dollars back from the federal government to carry out those services. So our real cost of providing general fund services in the state of Iowa is about 12 billion dollars a year. This chart shows you the federal government aid that we've received over the last few years You'll see in fiscal year 9, 10, 11, it peaked quite a bit, and that was because of the federal stimulus package money that we received. But in general, we get $6 billion. My concern is the federal government, amazingly, has finally realized they have a financial mess. They finally started to admit to it, but once they start to make corrections for it, it is going to flow down to the state and local level. We're going to get less of those dollars back, which means if we have $12 billion cost of services, but the federal government revenue starts to shrink. It's going to make it even more difficult for us to say, how do we carry out these services? My other concern is, not only are we going to see it at the state level, but we're also going to see it at the not-for-profit level. Right now, there are a lot of not-for-profits that get federal grants and aid. Those are also going to decline. So we're going to see a time period where not only the state's going to struggle to provide services, but a lot of our not-for-profits that help provide some of those services are also going to feel the financial crunch as we go forward. Other things as we go forward that I think are going to have a huge impact on Iowa, one is the federal income tax cuts. So there's been a lot of discussion. Are we going to extend them all? Are we going to extend part of them? If we don't extend the federal income tax cuts, it will have a huge impact on Iowa as far as a revenue decline. And why is that? It's because in Iowa, we get to deduct from our taxable income 
whatever federal income taxes we pay. So if we pay more in federal income taxes, it means we're going to have more to deduct, which means we're going to have a lower capital tax burden. If we have a lower taxable income, we're going to also pay less in taxes to Iowa. So going into fiscal year 14 and beyond, if that actually happens, we're going to actually see a decline in revenues rather than an increase in revenues, and we've got to be planning for that. The other thing is with the Medicaid expansion plan, which under the Supreme Court ruling is optional, it would have a huge impact on the number of participants that can be in that plan. Right now, we have about 400,000 Iowans that are served through the Medicaid program. If we go through and make some of the modifications, there would be another 150,000 individuals who would be eligible for Medicaid. Now, the federal government says that they're going to pick up all the costs at the beginning, and eventually they're going to shift 10% of those costs down to the state level. My concern is as they start to work with their budget, they're probably going to shift even more than 10% down to us. And this is going to be a huge impact as I was starting to Yes? Secretary Sebelius has already indicated that if the plan got too expensive, stage could opt out and not have those costs. Yeah. So why is the governor not at least providing those Medicaid services for the infirm, the old, and the poor now? Knowing that you can opt out of the system. Yeah, I think definitely if we see some of the changes that will happen at the federal level, I think the biggest thing that really needs to happen is to give states the flexibility to provide the services that will work best in their states. Right now there's this kind of mandate we'll provide this level of service, and there's a big push to say to the federal government, give more latitude back to the state so each state can say, how can I use my dollars? best serve my population because our population isn't the same as another state. So I think that's going to be very, very important. I think it will be a big discussion point when they get into the legislative session this year, but part of the concern is we've got to make sure that on a long-term basis we can sustain that. And the hard part gets to be is even though you can cut back on services, it's very, very difficult to do because you've already built some dependence on those, so you don't want to get, yank the rug out from underneath people when they need it the most. And especially when you look at our long-term planning, we haven't done a good job of long-term planning. So what I tell people is, when you don't long-term plan, you cannot impact the future. You simply react to the future because you wait until something happens. Then it's too late to make some of the corrective actions that we need to make. So the longer-term planning that we need to be doing here at the state is starting to be put in place when we need the same thing at the federal level because they're a player with us. In other words, for about every dollar that we spend for general fund services, we need a dollar for the federal government to actually carry out those services. So we've got to get our federal act together along with the states. I will tell you the state of Iowa is in much, much better shape than many other states. When we talked about the whole pension liability, where we're 80% funded, there were actually states like our neighboring state of Illinois that is only 50% funded. They have a huge, huge liability. But there are other states that are actually 100% funded, like the state of New York, which kind of surprised me. Um, so there is a way to get there and be fiscally responsible. We've got to be able to do that as we go forward. Just give me some contact information. Um, with that, we'll turn it over to any other questions that you might have. Yes? Do you know how much federal money you send out and how much you get back? Good question. The question was, do you know how much federal money we send out versus how much we get back? I will tell you in the state of Iowa, I can't tell you the exact numbers, but we actually get more back than we actually put out. So in the state of Iowa, we're very, very fortunate because there are other states that obviously have to give out more than they get back. Yes. Uh, the numbers you show uh, indicate and in every year expenditures exceed revenue. I thought a balanced budget was the law of Iowa. Very, very, very good question. Don't we have a budget balance law in Iowa? And so how can we spend more than we take in? If we apply that 98, 99% spending limitation only to our checking account. And then we show you how we balance our checking account, but we don't tell you what we did with all those shifts that we did. Um, it's like you or I. We can go and sit down with our family, and we can sit there and say, hey, look it, I've got a $5,000 balance in my checking account, but I'm not going to show you this chart chart statement that shows you I owe you $10,000. Um, that's the game that they're playing, which is really sad to see because it's there to help guide us, but we try and work our way around it. Instead. Well, doesn't anybody prosecute this? No, because um, it's only in the law 
and right wing technology. <laughs> in the law, amazingly, lawmakers can simply avoid following it. Isn't it amazing? They can avoid the rules. What they do is they use this long word called notwithstanding, all one word, which essentially means even though the law says that, I'm not going to do that. Um, most of us don't get the privilege of having that ability to use that one term. Yes. Yeah, don't we have a big reserve fund or a big <coughs> pile of money, and how big are they going to allow that to go, and what is the amount in there now? Good, Good question. Um, what kind of reserves, what kind of money have we built up? Um, what the, the law requires right now is that we set aside 10% of our projected revenues in what we call our cash reserve fund and our economic emergency fund. Cash reserve fund is there to help with cash flow because tax payments coming in don't go at the same rate they're spending money out. About three quarters of that money, that 10%, 7.5% then is actually for cash flow. The other 2.5% is for economic emergency. So like when we hit recessions and so forth, so we got about 2.5%. Right now that calculated balance is just a little shy of about $700 million. Good news is we've got that refilled. So very, very good. We've also got about $300 million on top of that, which is surplus that we've actually generated over the years. And I think with the way actual ended up this fiscal year, it'll probably be even a little more than that. But what I keep cautioning lawmakers is that $300 million is not an ongoing revenue stream. Just because I had a surplus this year does not mean I'll have a surplus next year. So we can't build ongoing spending there, but we can utilize that for good purposes. Um, some of the talk has been even to pay down some of our debt so that we have less debt payments in the future and we to keep those particular dollars to something else. Yes? What about the Highway Trust Fund? Highway Trust Fund, what's it look like? I will tell you that the Highway Trust Fund has struggled recently um, to try and keep up with the cost of roads and bridges and stuff. Um, and so there will be discussion once again, should we increase um, the gasoline tax? Um, I think a lot of people will say, I'm not sure when it will come, but it will probably come at some point. The good part is that road use tax fund that we put that gasoline tax in is protected. It has got the best protection of any dollars that we have, so we don't rate it for improper purposes. But we are going to have to address what kind of level of roads do we need to have and how do we have an accurate revenue stream to do that. There are several pension systems other than IPERS. Are they better or worse funded? Good, good question. What other systems do we have other than the IPERS? IPERS, keep in mind, covers most state employees and most local government employees. Um, then we have two additional ones. One relates to more of our police area, like our patrolmen and stuff, and the other one relates to our judicial system. I will tell you, both of those plans are very, very small in comparison to IPERS, but in both cases, they're even a little bit less funded than what IPERS is. Um, but uh, the holes there will be much easier to fix because the dollars are so much smaller. Yes, back there. Um, revenue means you get most your revenue are revenue from income taxes. Are, how are the income taxes in Iowa? Are they progressive percentage-wise? Uh, we're talking about the middle class here. Are the, is the class above middle class paying a progressive amount equal percentage-wise to the middle class? Good question. The question all relates to our income tax and is it progressive? Are we actually helping uh, make sure that upper level people pay more. I will tell you that uh, in Iowa, about 80% of our revenue comes from personal income tax and sales tax. Those are the two primary drivers here in Iowa. Our personal income tax is progressive, um, but I think one of the things we have to take a look at, which also needs to be looked at at the federal level, is what kind of exemptions, deductions, and so forth are provided. Um, and I think we will see some modifications there that will make it even better so that we make sure we have the resources to provide those that need assistance. Yes? What about corporations that don't pay state taxes because their corporation headquarters is somewhere else? Why can't we get them to pay out the taxes? The question is corporate income taxes. Sometimes corporations don't pay much because they're headquartered somewhere else. There's some fairly common rules <coughs> related to location and those kind of things. I think that corporate income taxes in total pays a very small percentage of what we do here in Iowa. I would like to see us give less away in, in incentives and help correct the property tax situation and the corporate tax situation 
so we can keep those dollars in here and keep them generated. But that's something that's very difficult to address, but it, they are trying to, and I hope we will make more progress this next fiscal year. Yes? What will it take to get Iowa taxes put on materials that are ordered through a catalog out of another state? Very good question. How do we make sure those internet and catalog type sales actually get taxed? Um, it's going to take 